Hey everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in this video today, I'm going to be doing it a little bit differently. Normally I would be showing my face here and I, you would see me in the bottom right or in, in the middle. But uh, lately I've just not been feeling like showing my face. But I still want to be able to take the time to speak to you, you as a community because... Since my last couple of videos, the uh, Cloudfly one and the WireGuard one, I've received a lot of positive feedback and it's making me really motivated to make these types of videos. Um, but there's still a little bit that I just I just don't want to sh keep showing my full face. I just want to be able to sit down, talk to you as a, a content creator, talking to people, trying to get my knowledge of cybersecurity across through the screen and into your into your brains. So, in this video today, I'm gonna be uh, talking about a few topics that have arisen recently um, that I think are just categorically never really talked about when it comes to cybersecurity and self-hosting. Uh, that I believe that it should be raised as a topic because even by default in certain levels of applications documentation, they never talk about it. And I think that you should be at least aware of when you're running applications or what you are potentially exposing yourself to. Let's talk about the number one rule in cybersecurity. So the number one rule in cybersecurity is reducing your attack surface. This can be done in many ways. One, removing redundant applications that uh, you do not use anymore. So you just remove them from your network. Then you don't have to obviously maintain those applications. Two, reducing the open ports on your infrastructure. So if you have, let's say, a port, 8080 open, which is a application which should go through your reverse proxy. Why is that port open? You don't need that port open. So just bound, either bind it to the loopback um, so it doesn't have, it's not open to the internet or use some sort of firewall in such as IP tables or NF tables to stop that from happening. And this is the key point that I would like us to talk about today that when you are a self-hoster, you obviously have access to a lot of applications and nobody really says to you, oh, if you run this application, you should not do this because it exposes an admin interface that you shouldn't really be exposing to the internet. And you don't really think about it when you're going through and self-hosting because Everybody just says to you, yeah, just go, go, run it. Which I'm not trying to discourage anyone from doing that. I just want people to know that if they are doing these things, running these commands, this is what's going to happen. In this video, I'm going to be talking about some remediations that you can run personally. Because when cybersecurity is an ever-evolving landscape, you need to make sure that you're always on top of your own security. Because let's use it as an example. So on this uh, page, so I'm on the Portainers Community Edition with Docker on Linux documentation page. And Portainer is a very valuable tool in the ecosystem if you want to use Docker without going through a terminal. So in some videos that are coming out in the uh, next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be talking about why I hate these tools. I think these tools are very redundant, um, but however, they do have a place to act inside an enterprise. Let's say you have somebody who you want to onboard, who's just a general sysadmin, doesn't have much Docker experience on the command line. However, they can click a few buttons on the GUI to get stuff working. That is fine, they can do that. So let's read through this documentation and I'll point out some things that I'm uh, not really happy with where, where they don't say on this. 
So to get started, we need the latest version of Docker. That's fine. Latest and greatest, great. Pseudo access, that's fine. However, by default, Portana will serve a UI over port 9443 and expose a TCP tunnel server over port 8000. Following this, it says the latter is an optional and is only required if you plan to use edge compute features with edge agents. Okay, that's perfectly fine. If it's an optional option, why do you include it in the Docker run command at the bottom where people will obviously blindly copy and paste into the terminal? But that's getting a little bit too far ahead of myself at the moment. Okay. So your environment meets our requirements. That's fine. Bug standard. You are using Docker via Unix sockets. That is also fine. But I think they briefly push past this um, as a topic. I will be reviewing um, how you can work around the Docker socket and not just blindly pass it into containers because that is a vulnerability in itself. But and this way, we're going to be talking about ex unnecessary exposing the admin interface. Uh, yeah, if you have SE Linux, you need to disable it, which is not great. If it is enabled, you will need to pass it the privilege flag. That is a, also a huge red flag. Don't do that. Um, but that's fine. Let's go through. Docker is running as root. That's fine. That is normally what how people run it in self-hosted environment. Okay, so let's talk about the deployment. So the first thing, this command will... Create a volume called Portainer Data. Perfectly fine. However, I want to break down this next run command. So this is going to run a container with port 8000 and port 9443 exposed to the internet. The way that Docker works is if you just specify the port, colon the port, it will bind to all interfaces. So if we uh, have a look, so if I just switch, so if I switch over to my uh, dummy um, root account at the moment, if I run sslntp, you'll see at the moment that I have port 22 open to the internet and that is the only thing that I have open to the internet. You can tell that it is open to the internet because it has this 0000, which is, means all interfaces. However, because uh, this is just a black box for this uh, example, if I do IP ADR show F0, if also I can also bind to my public WAN IP, which is 157.245.41.105, whatever. For this example, that's my uh, uh, like server's IP address. So if you see this or your, your public WAN IP as it, it is exposed to the internet so anyone can try to connect to it. So let's move over to their example and let's sell it up. So I'm going to tell Docker to create a Portainer volume. And then we're going to then expose. So we're going to run this command here. Um, however, because I don't really know what port 8000 does, I'm just going to remove port 8000. Thousand, and then we're going to have 9443 exposed to the internet so i'm going to join it okay that's great so then if i run ss uh, lntp which is anything that's listening on tcp uh, you can see here now that we have a docker proxy which is if you don't know what docker proxy is docker proxy is the sub command that when you expose a port it's just a listener that uh, allows you to proxy the incoming request into the Docker network, into the correct space. So you can see here that I have 9443 exposed to the internet. What I'm gonna do really quickly is if I just do IP ADR show F0, is we're just gonna grab this IP address really quickly because since we're exposing it to the internet, the first thing it's going to do is set up a is it's going to just set up a, have a setup page just blindly there so anyone could just set it up. So I'm just going to do that real quick. 
Okay, so I've just uh, logged into my admin panel and I've just set it up. So as you can see here, uh, I think I can just do get started and we have the local environment. Okay, so now this is my admin interface exposed to the internet. So if I log out, you can see here that we are going to my IP address, then 944. This is completely exposed to the internet. So there is no protection between this admin interface uh, through to the internet. Okay, so if we move over to... So if we move back into the terminal and we run ssLNTP, we see that it is definitely exposed and there's no stopping anyone. So if I hop over to my secondary box, so this is an attacking box. So what I'm going to run here is a program called Ruscan. If you don't know what Ruscan is, Ruscan is basically a, a port of Nmap, if I want to call it that. Um, but it's basically a Rust version of Nmap uh, that will allow you to scan a server for open ports. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass my Ruscan instance, the IP address of my original IP, and we're just going to run it. And you can see instantly it's managed to find that 944 is open, um, exposed to the internet. And it's managed to even find that it's a HTTPS server uh, running on, on that box. So this is how easy it is for an attacker to find that open port. Um, and also services such as Shodan will also be uh, running there. So let's take... So here is the product pertainer on Shodan. So as you can see, there is 86,000 pertainer instances, admin panels exposed to the internet. This is a crazy amount of admin interfaces exposed to the internet like absolutely crazy like these are all pertainer instances just blindly going to the internet so if we have a look at the ports so beforehand pertainer used to listen on just 9000 um which used to be just a http only port so you would just run the command, it would expose 9000. 9000 was just your default port. And then obviously it probably became a massive issue for them that people were getting man in the middle of attacks because if you try and log in with your username and password on an HTTP site, as people may know, there is no HTTPS, there's no encryption between yourself and the server. So people were getting their credentials fished or, uh, well, not fished, but man in the middle attacked. Um, and then they would lose control, obviously, the Portainer instance. And then we've got some people that are trying to hide it by binding it to a different random port. It doesn't really work. So, but this number is crazy. 86,000 boxes. And all this person needs to do is crack the username and password to log into Portainer. Once they manage to log in, they have access to the whole Portainer admin API and they can just start running commands, boxes, because you're exposing the Docker socket to it. So it's going to be able to do a lot of things that you probably don't want somebody to be able to do to your server. So this is why I have a massive problem with the Portainer documentation of this. Yeah, so this is why I have a massive problem with them just having this because they need to have extra documentation about what you're really doing because this is way too many admin interfaces exposed to the internet. Way too many. So now we're going to head over to the remediation stage of this. So this is where I'm going to offer up some options that you can do. So... In this part, we're going to be talking about IP tables. 
So when it comes to IP tables with Docker, it's kind of a little bit complicated because Docker has some NAT rules that it places on the system. So it bypasses the standard IP tables rules. So the way that IP tables normally works is you have a input chain. So the input chain normally ha holds your standard rules for the request. However, because Docker needs to be able to handle multiple networks, multiple different types of systems, uh, they set up a, a NAT uh, layer. So when the request comes in, that's how it gets proxy through the Docker proxy. It means that we can't just simply put all of our rules in the input chain and expect them to be executed. So if we look at the documentation for Docker, they go over how they insert two custom chains called one called Docker hyphen user and the one that's called Docker. They explicitly say do not modify the Docker chain because Docker chain is where they do all their custom rulings and the Docker user should be the one where you would insert your rules the way that you would want them to look. So going over this rule right here. So this rule here is basically stating that we're going to append, uh, no, we're going to prepend, sorry, prepend to the Docker user chain, that's the Takai. And then we're going to say if it comes from the interface of, it says extension under so if so in the rules here it says please note that you need to change this uh wording to your actual interface nine times out of ten for most people it's probably f0 so e t h zero and then it will correspond with the actual interface and we do it from there so what i'm going to do firstly is i'm just going to copy this command head over to the the terminal and they're going to clear it. So at the moment on my on my server, if I do the kill to 9443, we see that we get a response, which is that's the code for, okay. as well as this is my user. Uh, this is just my bog standard terminal on my main machine. So what I'm showing here is that I still have access to the machine at this current time. Um, for the example, I'm going to use my secondary box. So, this um, IP address here, so this 178 address. This is gonna be the address that I'm going to restrict it to. So whenever we do a kill from this machine and we get access and you do a kill from my machine and I don't have access, that means the IP tables rules are working correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste the example that they currently have in the system. Because I know my interface adapter is F0, I'm just going to put it there firstly. Obviously this, uh, so let me just f f walk through how this IP tables can command works. So the tag I stands for prepend. So that means we're going to insert it at the very top of the rules because the way that IP tables works is IP tables is a first match system. So let's say at the bottom of the chain, you have a rule that says drop if it doesn't match anything. Okay, so then above that, you will have a rule that says match if the IP address is correct. So as the request comes in, it will get evaluated against each one of the lines. If it matches the IP address, it will get accepted. If you have the J drop here, for an example. Um, however, there is multiple different configurations. You can read the, the uh, documentation, but I'm just going to walk through this one here. So this tag small i means I'm going to define the interface which this rule will apply to. So my WAN interface is F0. So I'm only wanting it to apply on F0. Then we have a exclamation point. So this stands for not. So if the source IP address, which is tag S, so if the source is not this IP, then we're going to drop the request. However, obviously this IP address here is not the one that I want. So I'm just going to take that away and I'm just going to go get the IP address of my secondary server. I'm just going to paste it in here. However, those of you who are keen to I that have seen 
this command you'll see that the current way that we're doing this is we're just saying that if the ip address does not equal the ip address then they won't get access to the docker network however i want to make this a little bit more fine-grained so i'm going to say that if the protocol is tcp so they're sending a http request and also the destination port is 9443 then i want this to match so that means that they also they have to be coming from my ip and also the port has to be 9443 the reason that i'm doing this is just to show you that you can make these match statements quite um filtered so if you do have multiple users and multiple different containers that you only want them to get access to you can fine grain it here hitting enter on this you'll see that we have no so now if i do ip tables back l you'll now see here that there's a drop command in the docker user which basically says drop if the tcp uh if the protocol is tcp and the source does not equal this 178 address and it's also going to anywhere and the destination port is 9443 then drop it if the if the if the ip address is not this so if i head back to my original server and i do the curl command you'll see that i get a valid response however on my my machine if i do the same curl request you'll now see that I have trying because I am now not being given back a response. So now I am blocked from this port. And that is exactly what we wanted to achieve because now we are just purely filtering that my IP address can get access. However, you might say, but what if I, I don't have a static IP address and I need to come back and change it every single time? No, there is another way which I, I, I'm more fond of doing, which is called port forwarding. So what you would do is you would bind the admin interface to the loopback address, and then you would then SSH into the machine, but do something called what is called tunneling. So you would tunnel that port to your local machine and then get access to it that way. That is my fondest way of doing it. So I'll, to showcase this, first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the rule. So to do that, I would have to run IP tables. Um, and then I'm just gonna do line numbers with the tag L. So you can see here that this rule is number one. And then we're gonna do IP tables tag D, which is short, short case for delete. You put in the chain which is docker user and then you put in the number that you wish to delete which is number one in our case doing that you'll now see that we don't have that drop rule and if we run we run our kill command on our machine you'll see that now we have regained access to that said machine great what i'm going to do here now is i'm going to find my docker container that's currently running with my machine and I'm just going to remove it. Great. Great, so now we have no, no Docker container, no container running. So if I do SSLNTP, we can now see that we have literally nothing running but SSH again. Then we're gonna head back to the portainer documentation and I'm going to recopy that same run command and I'm going to paste it into here and I'm just going to make a few modifications before we hit enter so where we're going to get rid of port 8000 because I don't use it anyways however when I alluded to beforehand was if you run the docker command just with the port port it will always bind to all interfaces. So I'm going to define an interface before this port to make sure that it only binds to the loopback address. So to do that, we will just type 127, 001, and then colon 
9443. In doing this, we will basically bind this address to the loopback. So nobody outside of this machine will have access. So if we run that and run SSLNTP, you'll now see that we have a, instead of having 0000 under 9443, we now just have 127001, which is also a Docker proxy. So if we then curl localhost with the 9443, uh, and if we do HTTPS, uh, I need to tell it to ignore the cert warning. So there you go. You can see that we have access to that. But now if I rerun the same command on the server that did have a connection, you can now see that it, can, it failed to connect because that port is not exposed on our internet. So if I rerun the Rust scan on that thing, we now see that we have port 22 open. Uh, but we that's the only port that we have opened on this box because we're not exposing Portainer to the internet Then what we're going to do is we're going to exit this terminal Okay, now since I've logged out the machine This is my current parameters that I would log into that remote machine machine where Portainer is running So I'm just going to edit this command. So obviously this is my SSH key This is the username that I log into and that's the IP address and then we're going to append some of these details. So in short, what this does, this will tell my machine that I want to forward 944 on my local machine over to the local host of the remote server on the port 9443. So this means that when I go to local host 9443 on my machine, that will be forwarded to the local host of the server. So it means that you can send the request to your own loopback address. However, they will be forward over SSH, so the tunnel is still there. However, you, and you are not exposing that. You, you have to basically log into the machine to get access to the panel. Now, people will complain about this and say, that's not really a solution because if I have multiple people that want to log into it or if i want to be able to log in from my phone then yes i agree that is not a single use case however this is the ultimate solution for me because you don't need to put any ip tables rules or deal with any sort of the clunkiness that comes along with that because sometimes your rules just never really fit the mold so great so we're just going to run this command and what you'll see now is that when i run it it will look like I've logged into the box and I have a terminal open here. However, if I head over to my local terminal and if I run SS LNTP, you'll see now that I have an SSH session open that is bound to my local 943 port. So that's quite interesting. So if I head back to my normal browser, and if instead of going to um, my IP address and then 443, because obviously it's not exposed to the internet anymore, if I go to localhost 9443, you'll now see that I have access to the Patena instance, but it's not exposed to the internet. It is just my own, own one. So if I go and grab my Portainer password and I log in with admin and my password you now see that i am now logged into my potena instance but i'm not exposing it to the internet this is just purely going through the ssh tunnel instead so if we run my first scan again you'll now see that the ip address is just 22 and that's that's the only thing you can find open because if I go back to my main machine and run SSLNTP, 9443 is just exposed to the loopback address. And that, that's the best way that I, I know to do it because you can set up a script that will 
log into the server and, and and set up everything in the background so you don't need to do any of this stuff when you first come onto your system and this is just pure ssh tunneling there's no need to expose ports to the internet this is how kind of how cloudflare does it to a certain degree uh, with their new tunnel technology um but it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that um but yeah this is just what i wanted to show you guys in this example if you do find these videos entertaining informative make sure to hit the like button hit the subscribe because i am coming out with a bunch more content uh this year um just finding time to get my thoughts in order about what i really want to focus on and cybersecurity is the one for me so i'll catch you guys around